Thank you very much, and I'm really glad to be here in Berlin. It's my first time, and as I've been announced, I'm Francesco Tiziot, part of Ivan, which is a company that, if you have an open source data problem and you don't find a solution, well, we can solve it for you. Today, we're going to talk about probably a problem that you didn't know that you had, using some particular feature that you probably don't know that it exists, but possibly you know about Postgres, so let's keep that simple. So, I want to say that there will be some controversy in the talk. I hope by, that by the end of the talk we will still be friends, because probably I will have a present for you. So let's start now. Let's start by trying to understand what is the problem that we are trying to solve. What is the NAXA problem? The NAXA problem is a problem that everybody has when we need to pack for a trip. Why is that a problem, though? It's a problem because we have an NAXA and we have a lot of items. And you know, each of the items has at least a couple of qualities. Let's take the socks as an example. I don't like walking around with wet fits, so I give a lot of values, a lot of value, to have an extra pair of socks in my bag, in my next set. So in this case, value of 10. At the same time, the socks are really tiny, they don't occupy a lot of space, so they have a weight, what I call a weight, of three. Let's move to the hat. The hat, I quite like my hat, value skyrocketing, 15. At the same time, occupies a little bit more space than the socks, five. Let's move to the trousers. I don't mind going out with the trousers, even if they have an extra scratch here and there. Also because I don't know about yours, but the trousers that I bought last time, they have an extreme weight of 15. Shoes, are, it's a mixed bag, value of eight, uh, weight of 10. And the same goes with my, one of my favorite t-shirts, which dictates the title of pizza. Value of seven, weight of 10. So still, uh, we have some sort of situation, where is the problem? The problem is that, I'm sorry to tell you, that, but we are not Mary Poppins. Our bag is not unlimited. Our bag will have a limit, and let's say that in this case, the bag will have a limit of 20. So now this becomes a problem, because if you do the math here, we will not be able to fit all our items in the bag. We will have to take a decision. And how you do this, usually, well, you know, you take all your items, you put them on top of your bed, and then you start picking a subset of them. So let's try. Let's try with the trousers and the hat. Let's do a little bit of the math, and we say that we have a total value of 20 and total weight of 20. So the max up is full now. Is 20 the maximum value that we can get? We don't really know until we basically check all the possible other combination. So let's do that. Let's empty the bag. Let's try with another combination. Socks, t-shirt, and hat. Total value of 32, much more than 20. Total weight of 18. So the next up is not really full. But if you remember all the items that we had, there was none of the item with weight less than two. So we cannot add anything else. Now the question, is 32 the top? choice. Again, we don't know. We need to find and try all the possible combinations. At the very end, what we are trying to do is, we are trying to maximize the value, while at the same time keeping the weight under a certain limit. And you know, if you've been traveling, this is some sort of a problem that we always had. Companies were giving you a limit of 20 kilos on your luggage. If you were going over 20 kilos, well, bad luck, you had to pay. But I also have been in a situation where a special airline didn't allow me to go into the plane if my luggage was over 20 kilos, because they had limits on the total weight of luggages that they could hold. But now, if you think that this problem, it's only a problem about luggages and traveling, well, not really, because all I said that this is a problem every time that we have to maximize a certain value, 
and we had a limit on another possible value. And if we think about the reality of what we do in the real life, we can apply the same kind of situation in a lot of other use cases. Let's think about you know, which tasks are we taking on for the next sprint. In this case, what we are trying to optimize is the benefit of, if I'm closing a certain number of tasks, what's the benefit of those tasks to the overall project? The limited amount is the amount of time that I have in the next two weeks. Or, now let's talk about stock. In this case, the limited amount is the money that you're willing to invest. What you're trying to optimize is the likelihood of those stocks to gain value in the next, like two weeks or two years, depending on your time frame. But then now, going back to travel, we touch only a little bit of the travel problem because we were talking about bags and adding items to it. But travel is an optimization problem which is way complex because you have a limited quantity of money that you're willing to spend. You have a limited quantity of time that you have in order to visit some location. And you want always to optimize the overall value, your overall experience in traveling. Now that I made you understand that you may have the NAXA problem somewhere in your life, let's go back to the initial little problem. So you may say, Francesco, I've been doing my bags since years, and you know, if you have only five items, that's an easy problem. I can solve it, I can try all the combination, and within 10 minutes, I solve the problem. And that's true, but you know, I live in a family with small kids, wife, huge family. Usually, our starting position is not like this, but more or less something like this. You have a huge amount of items that you want to bring with you. And now, trying to find all the possible combination and the optimal value of those items is not as easy as before. For each item that you are adding to your inventory, you are basically duplicating the amount of combinations that you have to check. But let's say, no, we don't have a lot of stuff. We can take a decision. Our stuff, our list of items is only five items. But even here, if you live in the same physical world that I live, probably you will not have only one constraint. You will have at least, for example, two constraints. For example, both the weight and the size of the bag. And even more, now every item, specifically if you are traveling with someone else, will probably not have only one value, but multiple values. Let's say that I value always five my socks, but my wife, she doesn't give a lot of value to my socks. She would prefer to pick something else. And the same goes for all the other items. Now the problem becomes a lot more complex to solve because you have multiple directions that you need to take care about the limit and also multiple directions in which you can optimize the problem. What are you going to optimize the problem for? The red, hurt, or the green one, or a mix of the two? All these are possible different directions that you are going to check in order to solve the problem. But now you may tell me, Francesco, you know, probably you are overthinking. Having different values to items is not something real. And now it's the worst part of my talk. I want to give you a real example of a case where this is a problem. Socks and sandal, yes. I believe there is a different view on socks and sandals depending on if you are in Germany or in Italy. I'm not here to judge. I just wanted to, you to realize that this is a real problem. So I believe as of now, we solved the fact that the Nexa problem is a problem that everybody has, and also the fact that we need some help of a computer in order to solve it on scale. So the next part of the talk is, why should we do that on Postgres? It's a database. Why should we use Postgres to solve this problem? Also because, you know, maybe we have our inventory data in Postgres already, but usually when we face this kind of complex problems, we take the data from the database and we solve it somewhere else. 
Is that a series of Python notebooks? Is that a new machine learning, some sort of tool that our company just purchased? Usually, we take all the beautiful data that we have in the Postgres database and we do a CSV extract and we load somewhere else. The problem with this approach is that once you move the data out of the database, you lose all the good security bits that you put in the database to secure all your data. So all the privileges saying which user can access a certain table, a certain column of the table, or a certain part of the rows are gone. Even more, once you start extracting the data from a database, well, you are giving the power to a certain user. And you know, we never had any problem with a certain user by mistake, sharing a huge data set in a public S3 bucket. That never happened, right? That's the problem. Once you move the data away from the database, now the data is wherever. You lose control. Even more, if you move the data out of the database, you lose what is the notion of what's current and what is stale. Because if you take a CSV, you move it somewhere here, now you have your beautiful data scientists that work on your data. They don't really know if the data set was extracted five minutes ago or three months ago. You could have people running on stale data for a long time and create the wrong conclusions. So my suggestion is, don't move out the data. We have a beautiful Postgres database with a beautiful engine that allows us to do a lot of queries. So let's now move and try to understand how we can solve the problem with Postgres. And the initial solution could be, you know, have my inventory table. I can do a select, and I select the first item. Then I do another join with another select from the inventory table, and then another join with another select from the inventory table, so on and so forth. And this works. I mean, if you select one item, another, 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 you end up with a correct solution. The problem here is that in this case, you are dictating how many items are going to compose your solution. So if you have a complex item set, huge item set, and you're trying to find the optimal solution, if you only allow six items to be in the bag, well, you know, you could find the suboptimal solution because the perfect one could be by including seven items instead of the six. The problem with a solution like this is that it doesn't work because we want not to put any limit on the amount of steps that we are doing in our selection, but only on the weight. If we have a variable number of iterations, a solution where we fix the number of iterations is not going to work. So we need to change our approach, and we need to start using the recursive queries. What are recursive queries? Well, recursive queries is this person holding the problem in a frame. When you apply recursivity in order to solve a problem, what you do is you check the frame, check the problem, cut down the problem in pieces, and pass it to yourself a smaller version of the problem in the same frame. Then the next step, what do you do? You do exactly the same. Check the frame, check the problem, cut the problem in pieces, pass it to yourself a smaller version of the problem. And on, and on, again. Until the problem is so small, it's so easy to solve that you can do it. And then you pass back up the solution of your problem until you solve the gigantic problem. This is recursivity in any kind of language. Now let's talk about how to solve this in Postgres. First of all, we need our table. So we had the initial set of items, and I wanted to provide you all the code that you needed to recreate the, the example yourself. So I created a table inventory. For each item, I have the ID, the name, the value, and the weight. And then I have my insert statement in order to insert the relevant rows. Now let's talk about how to write recursive queries in Postgres. And to me, when you write a recursive query, it's more or less like you know, jumping from a cliff. You have to state a couple of things. First of all, 
you state where you stand initially. And then I don't think I will do a live demo because that could harm myself. You have to say how you want to roll until you eat the water or whatever is done there. I have yeah, the other person that can take my, my place, but let's not use it. So you set the base, and then you set how do you roll over, how do you recurse on your data. Let's, take, let's see the code now. So the first thing that we need to say is a with statement where we tell Postgres, look that I'm writing a recursive query, so this already gives Postgres a hint, called the items. And I'm saying this query will contain two rows, sorry, two columns. Picked items will be a list of the items that I will pick in my journey, A number of items will contain the count. Now let's tell what is the starting position, our cliff. Our cliff is, what we are doing is, uh, we will pick one item from our inventory table, and we will create an array with only the first item that we will pick. The second thing that we will do is, we set first selection is one. I'm selecting one item. Where I'm selecting the item from? From the inventory table. And in order to start with uh, a soft start, sorry, um, I'm starting selecting only the socks. So socks will be my first choice. Now that I set my starting position, let's do the rolling part, recursivity part. So I do a union all, and there is an interesting thing. There is a select statement doing a select from inventory, which was our original table, cross join items. But you know, we didn't define any items table. If you look really well here, what item says, it's our recursive select statement. So here is where we tell Postgres, look that this result set is joined with it himself. Now that was all this mystery, what are we doing every time we are rolling? Well, we are adding the item, the current choice, the item that we are choosing now to the list of picked items. And we are adding plus one to the number of items. So we are basically saying, before we add socks, we now add the hat, for example. And now since we said both the starting position and the rolling bit, we can close the bracket and say, select start from items, our recursive query. And let's say we want to retrieve all the possible combination of three items, where number of items equal to three. If you now take this code and run in a Postgres database, this code will run. But, you know, we'll run, 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 and run, and we'll never finish. Because in here, there is a problem. We said our starting position, we said how to roll, we said our end close outside our main query, but we didn't tell where the water is. We didn't tell where we have to stop rolling. So what we are saying here is, you know, let's take this simple. We had a where close and we say, well, the total number of items is le less or equal than three. Now, if we take this query, we run it against the Postgres database. Beautiful. We get 25 rows. Those are all the possible combination of three items starting with socks. That was our initial choice. Is everybody happy? Did we solve the NAXA problem? No. Why didn't we solve the NAXA problem? Well, because we didn't add any of the NAXA constraints. What are those? Well, first of all, if we choose socks, we cannot choose socks again. We cannot choose again the same item. Again, your definition of the problem might be different. You may have five different pair of socks. In my case, I have only one. Second constraint is not really a constraint, but we are trying to optimize the overall value. We didn't even calculate what was the value of the solution. Third and real constraint, wait, we cannot go over 20. That's a limit. So let's rewrite our query in order to take care of the constraints. First of all, with recursive bit, as you can tell, the font is getting smaller, so we will have a little bit more code. So always recursive items. 
the first three rows are more or less the same as, uh, sorry, three columns are more or less the same that I had before. I have the picket items, the number of items. Now I'm also adding the item ID, that is the ID of the last item that I've be, I will choose in a series. And then I'm adding other two columns for the total weight and total value. Now let's define again our cliff, our starting position. In this case, what we are going to do is um, we are selecting the item ID, we are creating the, an array with the item name, and one as number of items, plus we are selecting the current uh, item value and weight as the total value and total weight. If you put one item in the bag, that's the total weight and total value of the bag itself. Now the rolling bit. Every time we roll, we select the, a new item and we add the ID in the first column. We add, we concatenate the item name to the list of picked items, and we add plus one to the number of items. Even more, we add the total weight and the total value, the weight and the value of the currently selected item. And we always do our lovely cross-join with inventory and items. Now let's add the constraints. We add a couple of where clauses. The first where clause is using Postgres um, array functionality to check that an array created with the item name of the last item that we picked is not contained in the list of picked items. This way we are not allowing picking socks two times. Then we are saying, look that you have to calculate that the total weight of the items of your previous selection plus the current item needs to be less than 20. It was our constraint. If we now close the bracket and we do the same select statement on order by the total value, what we get is this. Beautiful 33 rows going from the worst selection possible, selecting only the trousers, I don't really like it, to the optimal shoes, hat, and socks, three items, 18 of weight, 33 of value. We solved the Naxa problem. Can you spot something still possibly wrong in here? Exactly. We have the last six rows, which are exactly the same three items, just in different order. So if we look at this in detail, it's always socks, shoes, and hat in different order. Now, this is specific for the problem that you are solving, because in my case, I don't care if I put the socks, the shoes, or the hat, or the socks, the hat, or the shoes. Probably I should care because, you know, putting the shoes on top of the hat is not something that I would like to do, but let's say I don't care. In traveling, for example, if you have to go, you know, from Milan to New York to Rome, that's not optimized. If you go from Milan to Rome to New York, that's a much better solution. So depending on your problem, the order of the events could be something that you are caring about or something that you don't care about. In my case, I don't care. So how can I get rid of all the permutation? How would you do that? How would you solve this problem if you had to pack your items? Well, probably what you would do is you would check your wardrobe and you would order, like, I believe I'm reasonably decent at managing my stuff. I would order all the items either by item name, by color, by item ID. If I attach the label, I don't know how much compulsory you want to control your, your stuff in your, in your wardrobe. But we can do much, more, much the same thing with our query. We can order all our items by item ID. So this is the recursive bit, and what I'm saying here is the item ID of the next choice must be greater than the item ID of the last choice that I already made in the previous step. So what we are doing is, if we have a wardrobe always ordered, we always force ourselves to pick from the right side every time. But if we do that, well, you know, we can also delete the first statement because we are never going to reselect the same item. If we take again this query and run it, now we have the optimal solution. 15 rows 
we have no duplicate, we have no more different orders, and still, the best solution is how our socks, hat, and shoes always wait 18, total value 33. And you know, we solved the next problem with Postgres and recursive queries. Is everybody happy now? Are we still friends? Yes. The problem that I had with this solution is that, you know, we are 30 minutes in the talk, and I got 40 minutes allocated to me. And, you know, I cannot stop after 30 minutes. But something that initially I look at a bad thing now can work with me. Because I wrote a blog post about this solution in September last year. And I believe I have enemies with the Postgres people that are doing the release because literally two weeks after I wrote the blog post, they came out with Postgres 14. And they added two features that changed the way that we use to write recursive queries. Those two features are called search and cycle. So I believe it's a good idea to check what's new and understand those two features because they could help you. Let's start with search. Search, as the word says, basically allows us to define how we browse the possible three of options. If you check this, is the possible three of options if we select socks as our first choice. So with search, we have a couple of options. The first option is to say, I want to look near before looking far. I want to do first, I want to evaluate first all the options doing one step before evaluating all the options doing two steps. This is called breadth first. And basically, in our case, the first choice will, of course, be selecting socks. But then we will do near before far. So we will select socks and hat, and then we will select socks and trousers, then socks and shoes, socks and t-shirt. Now we finish all the one step away solution. We need to do two steps. So we do socks, hat, and trousers, and then we scroll all the rest of the option until we finish them all. This is the breath first, again, searching near before searching far. How do I write the query? Well, the overall query doesn't change. All I need to change is, at the end, I can say search breath first, and I define which is the ordering by item ID. And then I can parse my result with the order column that will be generated. If we take this query and we run against our data, we will, uh, look, we will obtain something like this. As you can tell, I start looking near before looking far. The first is I only check socks. And then I add the second item, socks hat, socks trousers, socks shoes, socks t-shirt. And then two levels, socks trousers, trousers hat, shoes hat, t-shirt hat, and so on. What is the opposite? The opposite is trying to go as far as possible before checking all the other. So it's called depth first. And in depth first, at the beginning, we will select um, only the socks. Then we try two steps, socks and hat. Then three steps, socks, hat, and uh, trousers. Four steps, socks, hat, trousers, and shoes. And then we finish. In this case, I limited to three options, to three choices. Then we go to the neighbor. We do socks, hat, trousers, and t-shirt. Then we finish also this branch, we go to the nearest branch, and you know, so on and so forth until we evaluate all the possible combinations. Again, if we run the query with depth first, we obtain a slightly different result, where we, you see I do socks, then add the hat, add the trousers, then I finish at level three, I check the, the neighbor with shoes, I check the neighbor with t-shirt, I finish the sub three, I go one level back with trousers, and then away. I'm going forward again. How the query changes? The only change that you need to do compared to the previous one is depth instead of breadth. There is noth nothing else. Now I want you to spend a couple of seconds reviewing the output of the queries that we saw. This was the output of the query using breadth first. Check the order column. 
This is what is automatically generated by Postgres. What we see here are two numbers. The first number is the level. But the level is more or less what we calculated with the number of items, minus one. The second item is the item ID. If we now move to depth first, we see that order column now is completely different. But this is an array concatenating the item IDs, more or less what we had in the list of picked items, only with item name. What I wanted to say here is that nothing of this was impossible before. It's just that now, with search, we have a more elegant way of defining how we are parsing the three of possible solution. And basically, this is all about search. Let's pass now to cycle. What is cycle? Well, a cycle is when you close a loop. And depending on the use case, cycle could be interesting or not. Well, let's tackle a couple of use cases. The first one is about traveling. Let's say that you are an American coming to Europe and you want to do a trip of across Europe. What you want to do is, of course, you arrive in Rome. Then you go to London, Paris, Oslo, Helsinki. And then you are wondering about what is the next stop. What you don't want to do is to go back to Rome because there is no point in passing two times by the same location. So in this case, cycles is something that you will want to avoid because it's losing time. Let's check another example. Everybody knows Bob. Bob gives some money to Maria, that gives the money to Karen, that gives the money to John, that gives the money to Luigi. Of course, when there is an Italian, Luigi goes, gives back the money to Bob. This is the perfect scheme of money laundering. So in this case, cycles, if you are the police, is something that you may want to check and look deep into. So depending on the use case, cycles is something to go away from or something to look into. But you know, even in our NAXA problem, we were handling cycles. Because for us, a cycle was picking socks two times. And we were trying to avoid that initially by writing the array function, by checking that the item name was not contained in picked items. Then we wrote the optimization saying, you know, I ordered my wardrobe and I always pick from the right. Now with cycle, again, we have a more elegant way of saying this, which is cycle using the item ID. So the item ID is the unique identifier of a specific item. And please create a column is cycle that will be true or false, telling us if there is a cycle or not, using item IDs that is a support column. If we write the statement and we run the query, what we get is something like this where item ID and picked items are coming from the query before, is cycle is a true or false telling us if there is a cycle or not, and item ID, again, is the concatenation of items, pretty much what we did with picked items. And we can immediately spot that socks, socks is a cycle. Um, socks, hat, and socks, socks, hat, and hat, socks, trousers, and socks are all cycles. So, again, what we were doing before was not far from what Postgres is doing automatically. But before we had to write our own code, now we have a more elegant way of writing down all how, how to detect a cycle or not. I want more or less to conclude because time is almost over. Reviewing what we learned today. I'm sorry to say we all share the same NAXA problem. Even if it's not about traveling, it's about taking the issues in JIRA, it's about, you know, deciding what to do tonight. All this is an optimization problem that we may want to solve using Postgres. I'm not saying that every time you want to book a table for a night, you go in Postgres and you insert all the data in Postgres, but you have always this option. Then uh, we understood how to write recursive queries and why they are useful because we are not forcing any limits which are not in the optimization problem itself. We are not forcing the number of steps to arrive to the solution. We let the solution, the optimal solution, come to us. We understood how to write recursive query with the cliff and the rolling bit, the base and the recursion. 
And then we look at Postgres 14, search and cycle options. I want now to leave you with some additional references that you can find by scanning this QR code or with the URL at top. You will see a page with four main links. The first one is the Nexa problem itself. It's the Wikipedia page talking to you about the problem itself. It's where I started my journey. Well, actually, I didn't start there. This old talk, the blog post which are behind it, and all the rest, are coming from a Stack Overflow question. So you can find, at least I found, enormous value in going to Stack Overflow and checking what other problems that people have. In this case, probably it was a student that needed some help to solve an assignment. Still, we can see that a problem of a student can be related to all of us. The second link is the blog post that I wrote right talking about the solution, but then Postgres 14 came out a couple of weeks later, and I wrote a new blog post talking with a different example, a traveling example, how to include the cycle and search features. This last one, and if you are still friends, this is where the surprise comes, it's Ivan.io, it's the company that I work for. As I said, we solve all the open source data problem. We offer a set of managed services, including Postgres, Kafka, Flink, uh, OpenSearch. You basically have to start up the instance and we take care of that. We offer an amazing $300 and one month free trial that you can use. If you're still my friends, come to our booth and we give you extra $200 so you can enjoy your journey better. I hope this session was somehow useful for you. You took something about recursive queries, packing, socks and sandals. I'm here for all the questions that you might have. Thank you very much. So thank you, Francesco, for the interesting and entertaining uh, presentation. You. Who wanted to be the first? Really wonderful talk. Thank you. Have you experimented with constraining the search strategy at all to sort of limit limit the search, prune the search space? So the the beauty of recursion is that you don't set any artificial limit to the solution. The problem with recursion is that you don't set any artificial limit with the solution. This means that recursion could easily get out of hand. We are talking about a complex problem. And the inventory, if you check the code, we are doing a cross-join with the table. This means that every time we are joining the table, we are matching every row with every other row. This could explode really quickly. So, how do you optimize this? Again, if you want to achieve the best overall uh, solution, you shouldn't. Because if you optimize, this means that you are taking away possible combinations. Still, like, it's the same, this problem is the same problem on a larger scale that you have with Google Maps, when you want to find a short path. What I believe they do, I believe so, yes, is that they somehow take some of the options out and when they don't make sense anymore. So if you have to go from Milan to Rome, there is a nice highway, or there are a lot of smaller streets around. But at a certain point, doing adding smaller streets will not make sense anymore, so you start deleting. What you do with Postgres, in this case, you add where closes. Let's say what you could do is, you know, you have all your item set, but the item set could be divided into categories. You could have the category t-shirt and the category trousers. And you could say, I want to pick one item of each category. So in that case, you are reducing the number of joins or self-joins and the number of possible combinations. Because, you know, it's all nice and easy when you have five items, but when you have million rows, if you do a cross-join with other million rows, that explodes really quickly. So all the possible optimizations and solutions to this are by design. There is no a magic flag in Postgres that will solve your problems. You have to go back to your design team, to, your, to the people analyzing the problem and say, okay, this, we cannot solve this in a decent amount of time. We need to restrict the field somehow. That's a great, great I was sort of curious if you had concretely had to find a proper solution to the problems you need to solve. 
Yes, I believe, depend on, depending on the size of the problem, you may find the overall optimal, or you may need to, at a certain point, cut, uh, cut out uh, options that start don't make sense. Thank you, Francesco. Let's uh, thank him together. Thank you very much. <laughs>